let me tell you about this film. It is called They Look Like People. It is from 2015, directed and written by Perry Blackshear. And it thinks I am DB for this description. Suspecting that people around him are turning into evil creatures, a troubled man questions whether to protect his only friend from an impending war or from himself. Which is like the classic trope of what <laughs> you're doing in horror and that like you're the villain, right? Um, yeah, I just want to say like a, a big sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> needed after watching this film because I was so stressed yeah. and I'm so thankful for the portrayal of mental illness in this film. Um, we've mentioned, you know, before that horror can be pretty gross and unkind to, to in representing folks with mental illness and usually is villainizing uh, or, you know, diagnosing them with some vague diagnosis, uh, which is one of the reasons I greatly dislike high tension for the flimsy mental illness explanation in the end that honestly just felt like they were saying that being lesbian is enough to be a murderer <laughs> which isn't true yeah. uh, and that's not how those things work um and we i haven't talked about it here i don't think but split uh m night Shyamalan's split got some harsh reviews for its portrayal of did disassociative identity disorder yeah um, which is a Disorder I've always been kind of fascinated with. I watch a lot of things. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about Hereditary. And um, totally blanking on her name and someone's yelling at me now. Mom, oh, I don't from know. Hereditary. <laughs> I don't know her name, but I know who you're I talking about. I forget her name. All right. Um, anyway, she is in a sh- was in a show called The United States of Terra, which is where she had disassociative identity disorder. And it was fun. And I'm sure if I rewatched it, I would be like... Not great, uh, but yeah. okay. The, but there were some things that I enjoyed about it. Um, but yeah, so that's like Split has some bad reviews for it, and that's not necessarily horror, but it has, I mean, he kidnaps children, so that was horrific. Yeah. Uh, and I totally get the anger for that portrayal. I thought it was like fun, but it's also like not fun to portray people's people illnesses correctly. like that. Yeah, um, and you can hear us rant about Midsummer's poor representation of mental illness in our mental illness representation episode and a bit in our Midsummer episode because we're like, you were not letting me off the hook about this. Yeah. Um, and Kat has also talked at length about how in reality it is often people with mental illnesses that are at risk of being harmed by others or themselves than they are to harm other people. Like, yeah. it's not really what's going on um and i think there are some really truly horrifying moments in this film and like tension uh where i was really worried that they would turn our protagonist into a villain or instill fear into the audience towards people with schizophrenia um, or other mental illnesses that feature psychoses and, and delusions and i am elated to say that this film does not do that so here there'll be spoilers in this land. Uh, I am not going to say the ending, just to say that I appreciated the ending. So, um, just because I really, really want everyone to watch this film. It is, you know, you can watch it for free on YouTube or on Tubi. Like, oh, wow, yeah. I feel like we watched <laughs> it for free. I, that that yeah, checks out. we did. We didn't pay for it. I would, though. I would. Uh, but you can. It's not behind a paywall, so you should watch it. Uh what I appreciate, one of the things I appreciate about this film, and it's similar to, like, Undone, like, in Undone, we really appreciated um, the sister character. Yeah. And how she, you know, would kind of meet uh, Alma where she was at and was just like, you're being out of control, but I understand we got to do something about it. And even yeah. um, her boyfriend, Sam, he also tried in certain ways. Um to kind of go with her and just be like, okay, you're going to do this anyway, so I'm just going to be here to support you. Uh, So you don't hurt yourself uh, and so that you feel safe. And so this film features a really authentic friendship. Like, it was awkward and intimate and really honest. The director, Perry Blackshear, has even heard it referred to as a psychological bromance film, 
which I thought oh, wow. was perfect. Uh, like yeah. someone kind of referred it to that, and he was like, "Yeah, sure." Uh, <laughs> so it, it follows a pair of friends, Wyatt and Christian. Um, Wyatt is the one who is suffering from the psychoses, and Christian is his friend. Uh, and because we're we're seeing it from, we get to kind of see both viewpoints surrounding this mental break like we get to see the friend and what he's experiencing and we get to see Wyatt firsthand experiencing it so whenever we're spending time with Wyatt we get to see his delusions and psychoses firsthand and that's kind of where the horror comes from because we hear the awful insect like insect like buzzing that preludes the arrival of beings that look like feel like people (laughs) right um it's like a really creepy uh buzz sound I'm gonna actually play a clip Um, yeah. uh, having just you know uh sound designed a bug related horror story i'm like no um we also get to feel the suffocating darkness that like skews the faces of the ones that we're supposed to care about uh like they're in the dark and there's like a really i don't have it here but there's like a creepy part where it's just like you hear like cracking sounds and then her someone like the shadow of someone seems to get longer than it should be <laughs> you're like uh, no so you get to like that's where the horror comes from is that you're directly experiencing or seeing the world through Wyatt's eyes and also you're listening to that because like I said you have the buzzing and we also listen to the phone calls from this mysterious voice that is encouraging us and inviting us to believe because we're special we're the chosen one and we've been tasked with protecting mankind we're one of the few people who can do that Um, So we see why it waver in this reality. Uh, There's that conversation with his therapist that may or may not have happened because who has therapy sessions in the middle of nowhere and overlooking a lake? That was weird. Um, (laughs) But he kind of brushes off his symptoms and he says, like, I don't think I have schizophrenia. I researched it and it doesn't fit. Um, And then he follows that up with you know, finally sharing his delusions that he isn't 100% certain he should believe, but he's also like, but what if it is real and I'm the only one who could do this? So it feels very real in that, like similar to Undone where she was like, that sounds wild, but the alternative is that I'm crazy. And so, you know, I'm going to believe it. With this, it's like the alternative is, you know, that it is real and I'm ignoring it and then bad things happen. Yeah, and, and potentially putting people I care about at risk because I'm not taking charge of this situation that has been told to me is something that will put, like, humanity at whole um, in great danger. Mm-hmm. And, like, like you know, we were getting is, like, you get this kind of superhero story. Like, what if you are the chosen one? Like, we read and watch films that revolve around a chosen one. Like, we just did a whole series on anime, which is, like, yeah. that's the whole thing, is that it's, like, you're the chosen one. You you have the special power to be able to see or do a thing, and now you are tasked with being able to do that. And, like, if you were to experience that, wouldn't you want to believe that you're chosen and special? Um, and wouldn't it be scary to ne- think that you might neglect it and then something bad would happen like it is there's a lot going in there and I, I appreciated that um there in an interview with scream magazine titled they look like people an interview with perry blackshear which is a horror entertainment magazine he talks about the dichotomous relationship between knowing something may be real but preparing for it anyway just in case so um perry says I took, uh, I took a lot of inspiration from the movie Take Shelter, which is a wonderful film. Uh, he goes and gets checked out at a psychiatrist's office with his daughter, I believe, because he knows that he might be in trouble. But then at the same time, on the way back home, he goes and buys canned goods for his bunker. And he says, it is those simultaneously knowing that he might be crazy, but still doing the things he has to, because it, what if it was not? I thought that was so complicated and confusing, which is true. And in this, it's like that. Like, he very much is like, I know this might not sound good, and then and people might not believe it, but what if I am really the only one who's tasked with this? Uh, and it feels real to me. Um, 
which is very vulnerable and nice. Uh, something I found interesting about this film that really adds to it is that it feels very voyeuristic. So it's not an outright found footage film, uh, but there's like this lack of non-diegetic music and there's no like odd camera techniques to give the viewer like a deeper understanding of the events. It's just like, this is what you get. You see what you get, right? Um, we're just kind of watching events unfold and it's, they're awkward and they're honest. Um, audio plays a really important role in livening it up. Uh, it was one of the first things I noticed when watching was that there was no music to like push me forward or tell me what to feel, which is a big part, a big component of horror. Like we've talked about that before in our uh, horror movie music scores with Sergio was that it like it activates things in you to feel certain things and like adds and compounds to the feelings that you have. Um, but instead with this, you don't have music to tell you. Instead, you you just sit there and you dwell in the moments uh, alongside the characters and you just feel your own feelings. Uh, we spend time with Christian while he's listening to his motivational ASMR recordings and they're like his crutch. Um, we even have this like uncomfortable yet charming like crispy whisper conversation between him and his boss slash crush uh mara uh so he like he really is sensitive to sound and it is a point of like power for him or comfort for him on the other side we have wyatt who's experiencing the buzzing and the whispers that indicate uncertainty fear and impending danger so it's like <laughs> sound oh my god what do we like yeah like which one do we trust which one is yeah and both of them are related to some complicated uh mental illness like both of them are kind of experiencing the sounds specifically related to what they're going through and i thought that was really interesting like no one is free of trauma in this mm -hmm. um i think the friendship is really the best part of this film because we get to see the care and compassion between the two characters, like how easily Christian rearranges his life to make room for a friend that he has not seen in a long time or talked to. Um, like why just walks into him like in on the street and is like, oh, I'm hanging out. I'm staying at a friend's house. But he wasn't staying at a friend's house. Um, but he's still knew within, like, even though he hasn't seen this friend in so long, that if he showed up, that Christian would open the door for him. And he did. Um, and he works really hard, like, diligently to ensure that Wyatt feels comfortable and included and not like a burden, which is mm -hmm. a relief. <laughs> like, he even invites him on a date that, he, like, his date so that he wouldn't be alone and, like, makes Mara, like, invite her friend who was, like, the worst. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and he, like, made up a lie because he doesn't want him to feel like he's imposing. Um, and I also think, like, uh, in that they face similar life challenges, like, they're both separated from their fiancés. They're working at jobs that don't bring them joy. Wyatt is no longer there, but he had a job that way. And they're navigating this complex relationship between themselves and their mental health. Um, and whenever Wyatt explains what's happening or hints at his own uncertainty reality, Christian takes it kind of well um, in that he digests and processes the information, not jumping to conclusions or lashing out like he's not like, what are you saying? He doesn't freak out. Like, even when <laughs> it was really intense and, like, anyone else would be like, oh, no. <laughs> like, in, even smaller reasons than the biggest part when that happens. Uh, there are times when, like, a normal person might be like, no. Or, like, an outsider um, be like, you crossed a line, you know? But he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Let's do this together. Um, and, like, he never tells why he's crazy. He's never like, you're crazy. I'm not going to give you a diagnosis, you know? Um, and when he looks to get him help, he offers his own experiences with instability as a reason to explain his understanding and why he should be trusted. Because Christian is also going through things. Like, he, his fiancé left him, and he had been expecting to be a father and was working to be this perfect, like, father figure. He's incredibly obsessed with what it means to be masculine. Like he puts a lot onto being like a man and what is expected of a man. And he needs constant petting via that ASMR tape. Uh, 
that like motivates him to continue. Like <laughs> he's doing it. Um, he admits that he had attempted suicide and that led to him seeking help. And so his approach to, to Wyatt is really the most beautiful part of this film. And I was really thankful for it. Um, cause like it could have been an entirely different story if it wasn't someone who cared so much for Wyatt, uh, just honestly. <laughs> so as we mentioned, we have two questions that I am going to explore uh, in this series. So one is, does it appropriately represent the horrors of a mental illness? And does it inspire empathy and compassion towards an individual with mental illness? And so in that same uh, interview with Scream Magazine, uh, director Black, uh, Perry Blackshear talks about his inspiration for the film in that he did his research. And so I really like appreciated that. So he says, I did a lot of research into uh, schizophrenia after being inspired by this video about a virtual reality simulator that you can put on and feel what it would be like to be schizophrenic. I saw it when I was younger and it was the scariest thing by far that I have ever seen. The fact that you could never know when it would be on or off the waking nightmare parts of it was so frightening. And the more research I did, the more people went through was more scary than anything I could ever come up with, which is true. And I think I remember, Kat, you talking about like one of your workshops like that you had to take for... Um, yes. And that Mental they were health. Like, whispering in mm -hmm. your ear. Mental health first aid. So uh, I worked for the Philadelphia School District for a significant amount of my adult life, I would say. And one of the trainings that we did, which um, would be really helpful for somebody who has never experienced any kind of mental health issue, uh, but they did not preface <laughs> that this is what they would be doing um, in that uh, they were trying to simulate what it's like to deal with a mental illness and listen to what's being said to you. So they had someone who would whisper in your ear, like with a cone, essentially, like a paper cone, um, and then a person who would be trying to tell you instructions. Um, and I, it was a very uncomfortable and triggering, honestly, thing to have someone like to experience both uh, and for anyone who does experience mental health uh, issues or has a diagnosis, you should preface that before you do it um, because it could be audit like auditory trigger for something like that. And they did not give. Uh, so that's a critique I had about that workshop. I think it is a good way of showing it, though. Uh, you just really have to warn ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should always have, you know, trigger warnings for those things. I don't know if there were trigger warnings for this film, but I, I mean, you kind of know going in that there's, it's going to be scary in that way. Um, but yeah, I think it, there is something like there's a game, uh, blanking on the name that I told you before, where the character has like uh, hallucinations and some of them are auditory. And so she's like losing the... <laughs> she's losing the thread and you as a player have to navigate like hearing all that and dealing with those hallucinations and also trying to fight through and win this game uh and I thought that was really great it's interesting that like uh that's one of the benefits of virtual reality which we also covered in a previous episode um that it can provoke empath empathy because it's literally putting you into like the shoes like you know like it's putting you into that place where you have to experience what someone else might be um and maybe you will better understand it so it i would say does appropriately um as, as far as i know um it is appropriately representing what he has perceived is the experience um and it uh and what cat will talk about about psychosis and, and certain delusions uh is that in similar to undone we have a protagonist who is told that they are chosen, special, and given a monumental task, right? For Alma, it was that she's no longer bound by time and space, and so she can navigate however she wants and prevent her father's death, uh, and ultimately kind of get to the bottom of his demise. For Wyatt, he is informed that there is an alien race that has been infecting and possessing people since the beginning of time. Like, they mention old times. <laughs> um, and it's with the intention of like taking over and they want to start a war. And so he's one of the few warriors who can save the people that he loves. Um, 
And so I think uh, why it has a little more understanding uh, and reluctance to believe it, but also like he doesn't feel like he really has a choice. Um, whereas Alma kind of did have a choice in some way. Like she still was going to believe it and it was, a little, you know, if, if you could save your father, like of course you would believe that you could. Um, I think the biggest plus to this film is that it does a wonderful job of subverting our expectations that are instilled in us from the horror genre and using those expectations to build on the tension. Like in any other horror film, why it would be the monster that we're forced to sympathize with, not the victim we should care for, right? Like he would just yeah. be... Yeah, we would be like, oh, we get where he's coming from, but he's the monster, right? Um, yeah. And there's a particularly stressful scene that finds Y on the roof of Christian's apartment complex, and he is equipped with a nail gun. And after having la gathered, like, a plethora of tools, like, questionable tools and gadgets from, like, eBay or something, um, but he's up there in an attempt to prepare for the war. So he was, like playing with the nail gun so we know it's powerful um and it's unsettling enough uh seeing that but then knowing that he might use uh this for violence against innocent people that he is perceiving to be the villains like because the whole time you know that he has been seeing people as the bad versions of them like it is going out so far as to like leave his fiance um because he thinks it, they got to her um and when he's on the roof we hear the buzzing, which means that one of them is near. And he looks down and he sees a couple and like random people walking along and the buzzing is there and it's it's like looming and suffocating. And he takes aim and when I was watching, my body just tensed. Cause I was like, here it is. <laughs> you know, I'm like expecting the worst. This gruesome like turn that we often see in horror. Uh, the moment that like our villain realizes that uh, it's actually not that hard to take a life, right? that they were chosen and that this is the war. Like I have seen this story play out many a time um, where they feel validated, like, oh, okay, killing is the answer, um, which would leave us with a film that's just old as cinematic time <laughs> with a mentally ill villain. Like that's just horror 101. Uh, but why it does not shoot the people below. And it was like a sigh of relief and absolutely like appreciation for not doing it. Um, because I really can't explain how worried I was the entire film. Like I was on the edge of my seat because I was just waiting for that sickening message. The, the lesson to be learned being that you can't trust someone who's having a mental break. Uh, Cause it really plays in that. It was like, would you believe this person? And each time the film surprised me because it would avoid it completely. Instead, it was playing on those exact fears and expectations so that I would feel that tension. Uh, whereas if I feel like if you hadn't watched or you weren't expecting what society has been telling us this whole time, you might not feel the same fear. Cause you'd be like, of course he's going to be fine. <laughs> like if this was a superhero film, you'd be like, of course he's right. And he's going to save the world. Um, there is a time where we see Wyatt vulnerable and kind of losing the thread there too. And uh, in this very long, excruciatingly long and quiet scene, he aims the nail gun at his own head. And for that, it was like a representation of the actual real life threat that those with mental illness and schizophrenia face, which is honestly just suicide. Um, so from the, according to a study by the National Center for Biotechnology Information, uh, apparently up to 40% of the premature deaths of those with schizophrenia could be attributed to suicide, and that experiencing auditory or visual hallucinations increase that risk substantially. Um, so you're, that's the real thing that people should be afraid of, like, more so than him being on the roof threatening other people's lives when he was threatening his own that's when it was like, whew. like, I was really like, I, like, I I had, like, I trusted Wyatt to a degree, like, he's a sweet boy, like, honestly. And so I felt very strongly that like, there's like, he really has to hit this breaking point, because up until now, he's been having these hallucinations, he has believed that there's something out there and still refused to do anything and hurt anyone. And so I w like, even though I was tensed, it was mostly like I was tensed to be like, don't make that the narrative. It wasn't so much 
n- believing why you it could thought do it, he but was going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. With, with the nail gun in his own, like that was really stressful for both of us when I just remember us really freaking out for that part. Cause it was like, Oh God. Like, even though, and that's like conversely, cause for a film, it's like, you're not going to kill off our protagonist this way, but it was still more scary <laughs> than it would be if it, you know, like then the rooftop in that way. Um, uh, and to kind of get away from that depressing thing, I really can't get over this friendship, <laughs> which I think is the strength of the film. Uh, there is quite a few scenes with Christian that uh, really touched me as, as a viewer and, and someone, like, you know, based on what we were talking about last week about being an ally. And I feel like Christian was a pretty decent ally. I'm sure there are things that could be improved, but I... I appreciated his approach and like we have a scene where Christian explains that he used to have nightmares and he like describes the monster in it and so then he asks why like what is your version of those monsters uh that are haunting you right and he's really delicate and patient with Wyatt um and when the war is fastly approaching and through a stressful interaction with Mara Christian's love interest, why is pushed further along into his delusion. And in his panic, he finally admits to Christian that he's been what he's been keeping to himself. And he insists he's not crazy and that this is serious. And Christian never calls him crazy. And he's like, let's calm down. <laughs> like, he's very cautious and visibly worried, but he's he's never like, you're wrong. This is messed up. Get out of my house. He's like, is everyone safe? Have like make sure you haven't done anything that you regret, and let's calm. Let's do this. Like <laughs> tell me what it is. Um, and later he has this scene and he has this line that I really appreciated. Um, that I will play for you. I don't believe what you believe, but I know you believe it. So just be honest with me, and you have to promise me not to kill anyone. Okay. So, which is it's that's such a Christian answer. <laughs> he laughed about yeah. a lot of things, um, but it really was like, you know, I, I that's does sounds not real to me, but it I know it's very real to you. So I'm gonna let you believe it, um, or I'm gonna tell me what it is so we can figure it out and yeah. make sure you don't hurt anyone. Uh, when he signs him up for a therapy dis- session after disclosing his own struggles, um, he even goes as far as to um, equip himself for the anticipated war. Um, Being very firm, like, you know, we're not going to harm anyone. uh, But he's like, okay, the war is coming that you told me about, so let's do it. (laughs) Yeah, like, (laughs) Like, let's prepare. Let's make sure you feel safe so that we can get through this together. Safely, yeah. Like, and we're not going to hurt anyone. You can be a passive person in the war. Um, And so, like I said, I won't spoil the ending. Only say that... Uh, Black Shear's subverting of horror tropes is phenomenal. He does a really great job. And uh, the messages between Kat and I towards the end were just a bunch of just like, oh God, oh no, please don't. This can't be. And just like a lot of like, <laughs> it's just like, oh please, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. So you should, re- you absolutely should watch this film. Um, and I sat in silence for quite a while while the credits rolled, just sitting in my feelings mm-hmm. and confronting my own biases that are ingrained in me from simply being a horror fan. Like, I was like, wow, I was really not expecting it to do this, which is another reason why I think it's like at the top for me, because I was like, thank you for, you know, using that to to turn me around. Um, and it was also really scary like, uh, experiencing Wyatt's hallucinations, like I said, were stressful. And the idea that you can't trust those in front of you, uh, which makes, you know, seeking help that much more challenging. And Christian has, like, another line towards the end, which I will play as well, um, that was just... <laughs> it was very vulnerable, and it, it, it was great. Because, yes, it's really scary to trust you right now, but that's what this is, so trust me, because I trust you. Sweet. Best friendship. Romance. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I felt like it was a very delicate moment that I feel like we need to keep in mind when we're helping someone manage their own hallucinations and delusions is, like, that we should trust the best in people that they they mean well and that whatever it is that they're going through, like, we need to offer compassion for that and 
you know, meet them where they're at and not make them out to be a villain or a, or a victim even uh, and just be like, okay, let's get through this. Tell me what it is that you're seeing and experiencing and let's work through it um, and trust them, like trust that they're good people and that just because you like as much as horror would want you to believe uh, having a mental illness does not make you a villain or that much closer to being a villain. Uh, yeah. I think if anything, it's just like, if you have like narcissism <laughs> or if you're like a sociopath or something like those are serial killers, they all had those like narcissism where they thought they were better than people, God complexes, but not, you know, the ones that they're always trying to, they're like, you got bipolar disorder. That means bam. Like, no, that's not. Yeah. That's <laughs> so not how it works. thank you. Like <laughs> Perry Blackshear for such a great film. It's super scary. Um, but, uh, brutal and honest and I appreciated it. Yeah. It was, uh, one of the best slash also stressful films I've ever watched. Cause says I, I will start my flax section very honest that I did not purse like I do not have a mental illness that has psychosis as a symptom, but I do have a very close loved one who has experienced psychosis and I have been in the shoes of Christian before and it is very scary and it was very traumatic and for me and for them, uh, but it is, I was so thrilled by this film's purse like portrayal of it in that like just like Gabe I was so scared that they were just going to make this another instance of this person has a mental illness so they are a murderer and we're just going to let that rock and we're going to make you feel sad about it but like that is what it is uh, mm -hmm. and it was just really great to not have another example of it because there are so many and it does create even outside of horror just in media and tv it instills this bias and stigma that people who have these mental illnesses just have to deal with every day and like that is like the biggest thing in terms of functioning within society is that there's lots of instances where society has made it that that is like a deal breaker for any sort of happy life mm -hmm. um and it was really cool to see a film that makes it that like you can survive and have people who care about you and love you and like want to be there for you through this. And that like, you're going to get through it with somebody. You're not going to just be by yourself and have to just like, and I also thought it was really interesting and nice that hospitalization was not what we ended up seeing or like yeah. that, that was the only route towards dealing with this. Cause that is something that does happen to people. That is what happened to my loved one, but uh, it's not universal. Like not everyone ends up in a hospital. So I thought that mm -hmm. was cool that they showed our, that there's different ways. Our mental hospitals, uh, in, at least in America, have a very torrid history of yes. not actually helping and in fact, hindering or using them as experiments. So, yeah, it's it's kind of it's it's I understand not wanting to trust or believe that, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> it's valid to be weary. Yeah. <laughs> um, 